Egypt out of slavery through Moses, okay? Gave them the law, the tabernacle, the sacrificial system, okay? This is how you can know me, how to relate to me. I'm a holy God. This is how I can be in your presence because of the sacrificial system. And they got right to the edge of the promised land, and they said, nope, there's giants. We can't do it. You can't do it, God. We're done. We're going to die in the desert. Our kids are going to die. And so God said, you're right, okay, you'll die in the desert. Your kids won't. They're going to be the ones that take the land, okay? You're going to wander around for 40 years in the desert. I'll take care of you. God provided manna for them every day, so it's bread from heaven. He provided meat for them. He provided water from them. The scriptures say that their, their, their sandals and their clothes did not wear out. God did not neglect them in those 40 years. But those adults did not enter his rest. Moses died. And Joshua was the leader. And we talked about that last week, how Joshua led the people in across the Jordan River, uh, marched them around Jericho, right? They marched around the city one time each day for six days. This was not Joshua's grand plan. It was a plan given to him uh, right from God through an angel, or perhaps some people have said maybe it was Jesus Christ himself, you know, pre-incarnate, given to him. And on the seventh day, they'd march around seven times. And at the end of that time, they'd blow the trumpets and yell. The walls would come down, and then they could go in and defeat the city. And God gave them victory. Uh, we read, uh, if you were to read through the book of Joshua, you would see how God gave them victory over the inhabitants of that land, and, and they, they gained the land. Now, the one thing that you'll also see if you read through the book of Joshua is they, they didn't quite finish it all. Like, they got, they got enough of the land, but there were still some people there because the Israelites weren't big enough to take the whole land and spread out all among it. And, and God said, but look, if you're faithful, if you keep following me, I will drive them out in front of you. And so Joshua gives this kind of final speech as he's near the end of his life. He says, look what God has done. Takes them through their history from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, the wilderness, the exodus, everything, and Jericho and everything. And he's like, now choose today. Who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve the Lord, Yahweh, or somebody else? You choose today. You've seen all this, but what are you going to do about it? And they said, we're going to serve and worship God. And then if we uh, pick up the story in in the end of, uh, actually in the book of Judges, I don't know if I have it up on the screen. I don't think I have it on the screen. It's in the Bible app, though. I gave you some extra things there. In Judges chapter 2, after Joshua dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the elders who outlived him and who had seen the great things the Lord had done for Israel. So Joshua died and throughout the entire lifetime of his contemporaries, the elders, that they had been there, they had seen what God had done, the generation followed God and lived for him. But it says after that, a whole generation, after that whole generation had died, had passed on and been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. So Joshua and all of the elders pass away, and there's this another generation that they had, they, they it says they, they did not know the Lord nor what he had done. Like for some reason, it was not passed down in this generation of who God was and how he had rescued them and everything that they had done. And so they decided to live among, for themselves. They took on the customs of the people that were still living there and worshipped idols and, and sacrificed to idols and sacrificed their kids to idols. And, 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 and so God withdrew his protection from them. Not to be mean to them, but to bring them back to himself. They, they forsook the Lord, their God, and their fathers who brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the people around them. They provoked the Lord to anger. And so, every time they went out to fight, not only was the Lord back away from them, but he was against them so that they experienced defeat. And if you read through the book of Judges, this is what was happening in the book of Judges. The people were following and listening to God. Then they decided to do their own thing. And the enemies came and oppressed them, and they're down in the dumps in despair and defeat, and they finally realize we should cry out to God, so they cry out to God, and God raises up a judge, okay, not a judge like we would know today, but a ruler to rule over them, to lead them back to the Lord, to give them uh, victory over their enemies, and then things would be good again for a while, and that completed one cycle, and then forget about God, and they'd be oppressed by enemies. they cry out to God, and God would raise up another judge who would rescue them from their enemies and draw them back to God and so on and so forth. And, and that cycle continued. And it wasn't always the whole nation. Sometimes it was different regions that the stories of the judges go through. But, but I want you to imagine, what would it have been like to live in the time of the judges? At the end of the book of Judges, it says that there was, at that time there was no king and everybody lived however they wanted. They did what they pleased. Now, what would it be like if we all just decided to do what we pleased? 
I mean, sometimes we look at our culture and we see that's kind of what rules people. They do what they want, how they want, when they want. And we can't just say they, right? Because we, we do that too. But I want you to imagine yourselves in that time. Like you are God's people, but over the last, the history of, of these last decades, you've seen your people go through this cycle over and over and over again. The bitterness, the despair, the brokenness, like you're there, you're in the promised land, but you are not experiencing the promised land how God intended. Well, this is the setting of the book of Ruth. It's during the time of the judges when they're in the midst of that cycle, when there's good things and they fall away from God, there's bad things, and that cycle is going over and over again. And we're introduced to uh, a lady whose name is Naomi and her husband Elimelech. They are from the tribe of Judah. They live in Bethlehem. Okay, remember that? Bethlehem. We're going to talk about that around Christmas, right? Uh, that they live uh, in the land of Bethlehem. And there has been a famine in the land for quite some time. And they hear that over in Moab that it seems like it's better over there. So get this. They leave the promised land. They leave the land of their inheritance. They leave Bethlehem. They go to Moab. Naomi, Elimelech, and, her two, and their two sons. And they go to Moab. And they're there for about 10 years. Now, we don't get a lot of whether they prospered there or not during those 10 years, but here's what we know, okay? The two sons married Moabite women. So, so they're married, and maybe they're going to start over a new life, but when those 10 years are up, Elimelech has passed away. Naomi's two sons have passed away. Uh, there's no grandkids, so there's no sons in the family. So it's her and her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. Now, back in the day, to be a woman who did not have a man in her life, whether it was her husband or a son that could prov provide for her, you're destitute. Like, what hope do you have? Okay, you can't earn an income. Um, there, there's nothing you can do really to earn money or to have property or things like that. So they are in this, they, they left a famine. And now they're in a place where there's been death and brokenness and destitution. And they're there. And no, Naomi finds out that the famine's over in Bethlehem. And so she's like, you know what, I, I'm going to go back. Like, what do I have here? I have nothing here. I'm going to go back to the land of promise. I'm going to head there. And so she, they, they all travel back. Orpah, Ruth, and Naomi go on the road to travel back. And, and while they're getting ready to travel, Naomi kind of turns to them. And she's like, Orpah, Ruth, like, why would you come with me? Like, I have nothing to offer you. You should go back to your father's house. You should find a new husband and in your own land. Like, you don't need to leave your land. You don't need to leave your family. Just stay there. And they're both like, no, like, we're with you. We're family. We're, we're going to stay with you. And Naomi is insistent. She says, what do I have to offer you? Like, like, what if, okay, so let's just imagine, okay? Say God does bless me with another husband and I do have kids. Are you going to actually wait till they're old enough to get married to you? Like, come on, just stay there. And so weeping, Orpah says, okay, and she leaves. And Ruth is adamant, I will not leave. I'm not going to leave you, Naomi. And Naomi is trying to persuade Ruth to go, and, and this is uh, what Ruth says to her in Ruth chapter 1, verse 16 and 18. Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So Ruth is not just saying, like, hey, I, I'm with you, we're going together. But she says, your people are now my people. Your God is my God. Ruth is choosing to put herself within the people of God under the arms of the Lord where you die. Even when Naomi dies, where you die, that's where I'm going to die. That's where I'm going to be buried. You see, as we're going to continue through this narrative, I just want to give you some gleanings from the book of Ruth. God is a God who redeems. God is working in the midst of darkness and despair and bitterness. And the very best is yet to come. Now, the very best is yet to come does not necessarily mean things turn out how we want them to here on this earth. What it does mean is that there is an inheritance reserved for us in heaven that we are shielded in order to receive, regardless of what happens here on this earth. But we do see in Scripture, and we do see how God works good from what the enemy meant for evil. And then there's a challenge that we can seek to live with a strategic faithfulness. That we know what is in front of us. We know God is a God who redeems. There's nothing beyond repair. There's nothing too broken that he can't use. And then we want to, knowing that, walk in strategic faithfulness. And we'll see that in the lives of Ruth and Naomi. So Ruth and Naomi journey back to Bethlehem. 
And, and when they get there, there's, there's kind of like this commotion among the ladies. They're like, wait, is that Naomi? Like, Naomi's back. Like, it had been 10 years. They probably thought they'd never see her again, and now she's back. And so they're, they're excited about that and, and kind of what has happened. And Naomi tells them this. She says, don't call me Naomi. You see, Naomi means blessed or pleasant. She says, call me Mara, which means bitterness, because I have experienced bitterness. I left in the middle of a famine. I've come back. My husband is dead. My sons are dead. I have no kids. I have nothing. Don't, don't tell me that I'm blessed. Don't tell me that I'm pleasant. I'm not pleasant. I'm bitter. This is hard. Call me Mara. And so Naomi and Ruth settle into Bethlehem, and, and uh, Naomi be- I mean, Ruth begins to do the, the kind of the one thing. Well, before we get there, Naomi's going to, I mean, Ruth is going to step into doing the one thing that she can as a woman to be able to provide for them, gleaning in the fields. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. But <clears throat> Naomi didn't know this at the time. But in the midst of her bitterness, God was working. In the midst of the darkness that she was experiencing, in the midst of feeling destitute, God was working his redemptive story, not just in her life, but in the whole world. And I want to challenge and encourage you. I don't know what it is you're going through. I don't know what darkness or bitterness or hardship you're facing, but God is working in the midst of that. He's working to bring out his very best. You see, God didn't promise a life free from hardship. He didn't promise that we'd have all the answers. He didn't promise that life will go exactly how we want to or will have the outcome that, that he wants. But he, he did promise us this. This is a promise given to the Israelites in the Old Testament, and I, and I think it applies to us. This is when the Israelites were in exile, and, and this is what God says, but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel, fear not, I have redeemed you. I've bought you back. I've paid the price for you. I've summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So God is telling his people in that context, and I believe for us as well, he says, no matter what you are going through, when you feel like you're walking through the water, it will not go over your head. Now, I don't know if you've ever been like in the deep in the water as a kid when the water is kind of like here to here to here, kind of here. It's not the most comfortable place to be, right? Or when you're on your tiptoes and it's right here. It's not the most comfortable place to be. God doesn't promise a life of comfort and ease, but he says when you go through the waters... It will not go over your head. When you walk through the fire, it will not burn you. You will not be set ablaze. Because I am the Lord your God. Because I love you. I've given others in your place. He's given Christ in our place. You see, Naomi didn't realize what God was already doing behind the scenes to work out this horrible situation for her good, for Ruth's good, and for the good of the whole world. She didn't have the answers yet. And again, we're not promised answers. We're not promised ease. We're not promised comfort. What we are promised is presence. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. The water won't go over your head. The fire will not burn you. I'm with you. We're not just promised presence. We're promised inheritance. Peter writes about this in his letter, first letter. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He's given us new birth into a living hope. Why? How can we have this hope that's alive, that bubbles within us? Because Jesus resurrected from the dead. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So we're birthed into this living hope, and we're also birthed into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. It's incorruptible. It will not fade away. And it's kept in heaven. It's reserved for us in heaven. Remember, we've, we've read this passage so many times because I think it's so important for us uh, as, as Christians to remember what we have. You're waiting in line uh, to, uh, at the grocery store or something like that and, and you leave your wallet in the car and you, you turn to the person behind you, hey, can you reserve my spot? Can you keep my spot in line so I can run out, get my wallet and come back? And when you do that, you're back and they leave it there for you. They kept that space safe for you. That's what it is. The inheritance is reserved for you and for me. For those of us who, are, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. The reality that Christians are shielded through faith by God's power does not mean that hard things don't happen, that calamities don't happen. That's not what it means. What it means is that in the midst we are shielded in order to receive 
that which is kept and reserved for us in heaven. That's the promise that we're given. When you go through the waters, it will not go to your head. When we walk through the fire, it will not burn you. We have this living hope within us. We have Christ who's gone before us. We have an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. It's reserved in heaven. We're shielded right now. And it says this, In in this you greatly rejoice, though for now, for a little while, you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And he goes on and he says that, that these come so that your faith, which is which is more precious than gold, even though gold is refined in the fire, that as your faith is proved to be real in the midst of the trials, God gets the glory for it. And we're going to see this work out in the life of Ruth and Naomi. And I don't want us just to look at their life, but I want us to see the spiritual truths that can apply to our own life now. God is still the great Redeemer. He is still working out His very best. And we can trust Him in the midst. So let's go back to the book of Ruth. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in the eyes that I find favor. So Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. And she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvester. So this is the main way that Ruth and other ladies like her that are widows and destitute that they can provide food for their family, okay? And this was something that God gave in the law. We look in the Old Testament law like God is really wise. Here's a way to live. This is a way you're going to be blessed. But his law is also about how you provide for those that don't have the things that they need. And one of them is, he says, when you are, are, are gathering all of your grain, it's a barley harvest during this time, don't get everything right to the very edges. Leave the very edges. Leave the corners. If you drop something, leave it on the ground. Why? Because you can let those, like Ruth, glean behind you. They'll pick up the things that are falling on the, on the ground. They'll pick up the ones on the edges. And that is how they are going to be provided for the things that they need. And so Ruth goes out. And unbeknownst to her, she's actually in the field of Boaz, who is somebody that could be their kinsman redeemer. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So as it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Verse 4. Just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they called back. Boaz asked the foreman of his harvesters, whose young woman is this? The foreman replied, she's a Moabitess who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She went to the field and has worked steadily from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting. Follow along the girls. I have told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water's jar that the men have filled. So, so Boaz sees her. He asks, who is this lady? And he finds out who she is. He, he's heard her story and he goes to her and says, hey, stay in my field. I'll make sure you're safe. You can drink from the water. You can gather right along with my servant girls. I'll provide for you here. I'll make sure you're safe. Just stay here. Don't go in somebody else's field. I will provide for you. And, and here's Ruth's response. She bowed down with her face to the ground. She exclaimed, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you would notice me a foreigner? This isn't just a, a, a woman of Israel. Like She's from another country. She's a Moabitess. And she's like, why have, you, why have I found such grace? That's that word for favor. Why have I found such grace in your eyes? I'm not even an Israelite. I'm not even a Hebrew. And here's what Boaz says. He points to two things. I've been told about what you've done. He knows what she's done. He's heard her story. What you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father, your mother, your homeland. And you came to live with the people you did not know. I've heard the things that you've done. And in response to that, I say, may the Lord richly repay you for what you've done. But he also notices something else, not just what she's done, but he says, may you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Ruth, I've seen what you've committed to with your mother-in-law, but I've seen something different. I've also seen that you are choosing to leave your own land and to cling to the Lord our God and take refuge under his wings. And so I want to be a vessel of blessing from him through me to you. So stay in my field. I'll take care of you. I'll provide for you. I'll make sure that you are safe. Ruth says, May I continue to find faith in your eyes, my Lord. You have given me comfort and have spoken kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of even one of your servant girls. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come over here and have some bread. Dip it in the wine vinegar. 
When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all that she wanted and had some left over. And she got up to glean. Boaz gave orders to his men, even if she gathers among the sheaves, don't embarrass her. So even if she goes around where they've collected everything to find all the things that they picked up, he says, leave her alone, don't embarrass her. Rather, even pull out some of the stalks and leave them there. And don't rebuke her. Like, accidentally, on purpose, pull some stuff out and leave it for her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about an, an ephah. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, it's about three-fifths of a bushel. Anybody, I mean, can you picture that? Three-fifths of a bushel? Okay, what's a bushel? Okay, so it's about 10 two-liters a pop. Okay, that's about what, what three-fifths of a bushel would be. About 10 two-liters a pop. About five and a half gallons of milk, okay? Or about 30 pounds of barley that she got on that, that one day there. So she worked really hard. God provided. God provided through Boaz, and she was willing to do the work. Let's continue on in the narrative. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one whose place she had been working. Oh, because her, her mother-in-law is like, where did you, like, how did you get all this stuff? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So then she says, uh, she talks about Boaz. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. That man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabitess said, He even said to me, Stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all the grain. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, It will be good for you, my daughter, to go with his girls, because in somebody else's field you may be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the servant girls of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvest were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. So Naomi is saying, Blessed be Boaz. Like he's remembering our family. He is somebody that could be our kinsman redeemer. Now, now what is a kinsman redeemer? Well, if we were to look in the book of Leviticus, again, God's law is, is perfect. He's wise. He's providing for his people, and he's providing for those that, that have found themselves uh, when they're destitute and they don't have what is needed. So um, there's a concept in Scripture called the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years, there was a year of Jubilee. And in that year of Jubilee, everybody who had land they, and sold it got it back. Okay? So when you sold your land, you weren't really selling it. You were leasing it until the next year of Jubilee. So if it was 10 years out from the year of Jubilee and you needed to sell your land, the price was basically leasing it for 10 years because in 10 years you'd get it back. Now, God had given this system so that if a family fell into hard times and had to sell their land or their property or themselves, it would not be this perpetual uh, generational poverty. Every 50 years, there was a reset. They would get their land back and they had the opportunity to start over, so to speak. So that was built in to the old covenant, the, la- the year of Jubilee. Also, y- your relative could buy back your land for you to be able to redeem it for you so that you would be able to have it back and be able to have your, your, your inheritance. And that's what the kinsman redeemer was. They had to be a near of kin. They had to be family. They had to be able to redeem. They actually had to have the money needed to redeem, to pay the price that releases your land so that you could have it back. They had to be willing to redeem. Like they had to, yeah, this is worth it. I'm going to spend the money to redeem you, not for me, but for your family so that your family can continue its legacy. And the redemption was completed when the price was completely paid. So when the price was paid, it was completed. And so that is what a kinsman redeemer is. And that's what the opportunity that Naomi sees, Boaz is somebody who could be this kinsman redeemer. So in chapter 3, a plan is hatched. It's the end of the harvest time. And so Naomi goes to Ruth and she says, Hey, it's the end of harvest time, so they're all going to be at the the, the threshing floor. They're going to be, it's going to be this time of, uh, of celebration. So here's what I want you to do, Ruth. Okay? Get washed up, put your makeup on, and you're going to go out to the threshing floor in the middle of the night. Okay? And here's what you're going to do. You're going to uh, find where Boaz is sleeping, lay down next to him, and you're going to uncover his feet. You're going to take the blanket off of his feet. And she, but Ruth is kind of like, whoa, that, that seems like a very weird, awkward thing to do. Why am I supposed to do that? And, and Naomi says this. This is what you're going to do. When he wakes up, you tell him, will you put your blanket over me? Will you take care of me? Will you redeem me and my family? Okay, that's what, that's what she's going to be asking. So Ruth goes there in the middle of the night. The plan goes according to plan. Uh, she lays down next to Boaz and covers his feet. He wakes up and he's surprised to see this lady next to him. 
And he, he sees that it's Ruth, and he's like, what, what do you want? What do you want? What do you need? And she says, will you put your, your cloak over me? Now, now here's, here's something that we miss in English. The Hebrew word for cloak is the same word for wing. You see, Boaz saw, may God bless you, Ruth, because you have taken shadow on the shelter of the wing of the Lord. And so she is saying to Boaz, will you put your wing over me and my family and redeem us? Will you be our kinsman redeemer? And so Boaz says, I'd love to, I want to, but I'm not first in line. So I don't have the authority to do that. But in the morning, you wake up and you leave before everybody else wakes up, okay, because they shouldn't know that you're here tonight. But I do not rest because I am going to make sure that this happens. I'll find the guy who is first in line and I'll, either he will redeem you or I will. And so Ruth comes back to Naomi and she tells Naomi what had happened and, and Naomi kind of, yeah, yeah, like we should get ready because Boaz is not going to rest until this happens. And so Boaz goes to the, the city gate because that's where you would do these business type transactions and he sees the other guy, okay, who is first in line to be the kinsman redeemer. Now we need a name for him. He doesn't have a name in scripture. Anybody have a good name for the first in line kinsman redeemer? What was that? John. John. <laughs> do you want a different name, John, for him? Adam, is that? <laughs> All right, John. Sorry, John. So his name is John, okay? Maybe. We don't know. So Boaz goes up to John. He says, John, um, I, I want you to know that the land of Elimelech, who is Naomi's husband, is for sale and it is offered up to you that you can buy it and redeem it so that Elimelech's name can continue. And the guy's like, that sounds like a great idea. I'll do it. And Boaz says, but wait, John, there's one more thing. As part of that sale, you will receive Ruth as your wife so that when you guys have kids, it will be like in Elimelech's name to raise up his family so that their lineage continues on. And the guy's like, I can't do that because that would endanger my own estate. And so Boaz says, well, then I will do it. Now, they had this really interesting custom when they did property sales like this. One person would take off his shoe and give it to the other, okay? I'm not going to do that for the people in the front row, okay? So... John takes off his shoe and gives it to Boaz. And Boaz in the middle of the, the city gate, so the elders and everybody are there, says, Today I have purchased the land of Elimelech, Naomi, and I have taken Ruth as my wife. So it was, it was settled. He paid the ransom, so to speak. He redeemed. He became that kinsman redeemer. And so uh, Ruth and, and Boaz get, get married. And, and, here's a, and then and they have a baby. And the baby's name is Obed. And here is um, the end of the story. <clears throat> so the women said to Naomi, Praise be the Lord who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son and they named him Obed. And he was the father of Jesse, the father of King David. So we see in this story how God's redemption worked out the very best for them. But we see a bigger picture than that. Because you see, Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse is the father of King David, and King David is the ancestor, uh, in, in human terms, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is the great Redeemer. Now back in Moab, when they're getting ready to leave, and, and do you think they would have imagined what God was doing behind the scenes? Not just for them, but for the whole world. You see, Jesus is a true and better Boaz because he is the ultimate kinsman redeemer. Remember, redemption is when release is affected because of the payment of a ransom. And I want us to spend a, a couple minutes now unpacking more. How is Jesus the ultimate kinsman redeemer? In the book of Ephesians, it, it said, Paul says this, In Jesus we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. So he says, look, in Jesus we have redemption, released for us because the ransom has been paid. What was the payment? It was His blood. And what is the release? It's release from our sins. Well, our sins have been forgiven. They've been washed away. It's released from the penalty of sin. It's released from the bondage and the imprisonment of sin. And it's given because God has lavished His grace on us. Now, lavish, that's what I like to do when I have kuup on ice cream. I like to lavish my kuup on my ice cream. That's a picture of the lavishness of God's grace. So, Jesus is the ultimate kinsman redeemer. This is why. 
He's our near of kin through the incarnation by becoming a human. The book of Hebrews says that it's not angels that he came to save, it's us, it's humans. He took on flesh and blood so that by his death he may rescue us from the fear of death. We don't have to fear death because we know the inheritance that comes after that. So he's our kinsman because he actually became a human. He's fully God and and fully man, which makes him more than able to redeem. Because he is a human, he can he can stand in our place to take the punishment that we deserve, to pay the price that we deserve, to die in our place because he's human. But he's not just because he's human, because he's fully God. The punishment doesn't destroy him. He destroys the punishment. He's more than willing to redeem. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. Because God loved you and me, he gave willingly. That everybody who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And the redemption price has fully been paid. The redemption is completely complete. In the book of Hebrews, it says that when Christ came, he didn't come with the blood of goats and rams, but he came with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once of all by his own blood, having obtained eternal, forever redemption. So what does this mean for us? What have we been redeemed from? And what are we redeemed to? Again, in the book of 1 Peter, Peter says this. He says, Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. This isn't your home. God, God, God judges without partiality, so, so live in a reverential fear. Why? Not because we're afraid of punishment, but we have reverence because we know what has been paid for you and me. For you know that it was not with perishable things, you know, things like silver and gold and all those expensive things. It wasn't with those things that you were bought back. That wasn't the price paid to release you. You were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. We live in reverential fear, not because we're fearful of punishment, but because of the worth God has given us because he said that we were worth the shedding of his blood. And that's a weighty thing. And he says, you've been redeemed away from the life handed down to you from your forefathers. An empty, vain life. A life with no purpose. A life of just selfishness, of just trying to get ahead, of doing, of doing what you want to do, of, of trying to measure up on your own, of trying to be good enough. You've been redeemed from that empty way of life. You see, if you want to have a life of purpose, it comes from knowing that you've been redeemed by Jesus Christ. That's where your purpose comes from. So we've been redeemed away from that life. And Titus chapter 2 says what we've been redeemed to. Paul writes this to a young man named Titus. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness, worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. The grace of God teaches us to say no to those things and yes to these things while we wait for the blessed hope. The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who, get this, gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness. An empty life of selfishness and wickedness. And to purify him for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. We have been redeemed from a vain, empty, selfish, sinful life that we may be God's people and we may be zealous for good works, bubbling over to do what is good. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to be redeemed. So what does all this mean for us today? Remember, God is a God who redeems. God is working in the midst of darkness and despair and brokenness and hardship and our humanness. God is working. And the very best is yet to come. And again, it doesn't mean that we're going to have all the answers. It doesn't mean that the waters won't get really high, that the fire won't come, but it means we won't be burned. It means the water won't go over our head. It means that God will be with us all the time, no matter what. You see, Ruth became the bride of Boaz. The church becomes a bride of Christ. Everything is made new. We're given new, redeemed, heavenly bodies. There's no tears, aches, pains, or sorrows in heaven. It's something, a redemption that you can receive by faith. You see, what did, Bo- what did Ruth have to do to receive it? As soon as Boaz knew what, what was up, he went there. He paid the price. He offered his hand. 
That's what Christ has done for you and for me. He's paid the price. He's died on the cross. He reaches his hand out and says, I've paid the price. Do you want it? And if you want it, you can just trust you. Save me. And I'll save you. I want to end with this uh, picture of of redemption. Uh, I'm stealing this uh, illustration from my dad, who's a pastor, and I think he'd be okay with that. Sometimes that's what pastors do. We steal things from other people like that. Um, I have this, uh, it's kind of like a Twinkie. It's a hostess thing. It's a chocolate thing. Anybody like these? Anybody? One person? Okay. Okay. Well, I have more in my office, maybe, but I know some of them are going to be my kids. Now, hopefully I bought the right kind. Yeah, okay. See, there's some cream inside. Now, um, I don't know about you, okay, but if you like these, to me, the best part of these is the cream that's inside, right? Like, I mean, have you ever, like, bitten in one of these thinking that there'd be cream inside and there wasn't? Yeah, and then how, you're like, like, I know it's chocolate and frosting, but, like, there's supposed to be cream in it, Right? This, this is what sin does to our lives. Like, we're like this. Sin, it doesn't eat it, but I'm going to eat it because I can. It, it takes the cream out of our life, so to speak. Like, this thing, like, the worth that I attributed to this was because it was a cream-filled Twinkie or whatever it is. I think it's called a zinger, okay? Chocolate zinger. And so it's empty. You see, this is what sin does in our life. Like, it, it takes the worth out of us. Like we're empty, we're, we're broken, we have nothing to offer. And when we are like this, when we are sinners, enemies of God, Jesus died for you and me and redeemed us. Now what does that redemption look like? Like Jesus uh, paid the price that releases us, but it doesn't just release us that now we're free, but he puts the worth back into us, okay? So I have this cool up here. This is a picture of the redemption that God offers us, Okay? He fills us back up. Okay? So it's filled back up. And in my opinion, this stuff tastes much better than the other cream. Okay? In my opinion. And I think that makes sense. Because we're filled back up with His grace. Not back to how we were before, but with the righteousness of God. But did I lavish it on here? I didn't. No. Okay? I'm going to do it over here in case I spill it on the pulpit. Okay? Because it will clean up. Okay? Okay? Now, here's the thing. Sin wants to steal from us. Satan's come to steal, kill, and destroy. God has come that we may have life and have it to the full, okay? And when God redeems us, he puts the worth back into us because he paid the price. And here's the challenge, that we would live with a strategic faithfulness. We would realize the gift we've been given, and we would seek to live it out. God, how can I be that missionary in my own life? How can I love and support my family? How can I join in what you're doing in this place? Because here's the thing, okay? If I were to take a bite of this, okay, it kind of looks something like that. This way, this way. Mm-hmm, okay. No. Bear with me. I got napkins. Did I get on this? It's good. It's supposed to be. (laughs) When God's grace is in our life and we received it, it's evident. Right? Okay? And I won't. (laughs) It's part of the illustration. (laughs) And I won't. But if I would have came over and gave Steph a hug, God's grace would have got on her too, right? Did I get it all? Good enough? <laughs> like, you're good enough. Okay, but wait. All, all joking aside, if you've accepted Christ, you have been redeemed. The worth has been put back into you. God desires that His grace shows up in our life, not all over our face, okay? but it shows up because we realize the gift we've been given. And He desires that that grace comes out of us on the others as we seek to live for Him. So if you're a Christian, I want you to know that the price has been paid for you to be redeemed. You've been filled back up so that you can be sent out with the good news of Jesus Christ. If you're not a Christian, then I want you to know Jesus died in your place because of your sin that separates you from God. 
And Jesus looked at you and he said, I love that person too much to let them die away from me and spend eternity separated from me in heaven. And he died in your place. And he holds his hand out to you. And all you need to do is trust me. I washed your sins away. I died in your place. I have this gift to give you of salvation. Do you want it? And scriptures say it's not how good we are. It's not what we do. It's when we look at that and we say, I need that. I need it. And I trust that you want to give it to me. Say, I trust you. And when you do that, you pass from death to life. And if you've never made that decision to follow Christ today, then uh, grab me in the lobby today. Let's talk about it. Because there's no hoops to jump through. There's simply a gift to be received. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for today. And I thank you for your word. I thank you that you are the God who redeems. There's nothing broken beyond repair that you can't redeem. So we lift up our eyes to you in trust and in confident hope and expectation that you will work out the very best that you have for us that you will shield us in order for us to receive the inheritance that you receive. And so we worship you and love you and we ask that you'll give us the strength to walk in your grace and the purpose you've given us to be your witnesses and ambassadors. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.